It is the most fundamental experience of all, defining our waking moments and giving rise to all that we think and feel. Without consciousness, we have no way of proving we or anything else exists. And yet, what it is, and why we have it, remain a mystery that some of the greatest minds have been unable to solve. The only way I know I exist is because I'm conscious. I wake up in the dark of a hotel room, I'm discombobulated because I'm jet-lagged, I have no idea where I am, even who I am and what country I am, yet I know I exist because I see something. Rapid advances in our understanding of how the brain works might one day allow us to pinpoint the parts of the brain that generate consciousness. But will something as objective as science be able to explain what it feels like to be us? Consciousness by its nature is private. It's subjective. I know about my consciousness from the first person point of view. Other people can only know about my consciousness very indirectly. Philosophers have been trying to answer some of these questions for millennia. In the past couple of centuries, scientists have joined them. Debate can be fierce. In fact, some scholars reckon the puzzle of consciousness is something the human mind is incapable of solving. I think that's not just wrong, I think it's, it's uh, culpably wrong. It isn't impossible at all. It's just that we have to buckle down and do it. One thing that both disciplines can agree on is that consciousness arises in the brain. Made up of roughly 85 billion neurons and other supporting cells about which we know little, the brain consumes almost 20% of our energy, despite comprising just 2% of our mass. Every so often I get kind of interested in astronomy and cosmology, because you look out there and you think, oh gosh, this is amazing, you know, it's almost limitless. But then I turn around and I kind of introspectively think about the brain and it's kind of like a universe within. We're a long ways of understanding how it works, but if we could get down to figuring out how a neuron works, by God, then we could deal with it two neurons, and then four neurons, and then four million neurons, and then a hundred million. Helped by developments in imaging, partly pioneered by Dr. Reichel and his team, Scientists can study in some detail the two enormous folded sheets of outer brain called the cerebral cortex. This plays a crucial role in higher brain functions like memory, perception, thought, and language. And I have two of them in my left and right. And, and it's part of this sheet that gives rise to consciousness. This sheet also gives rise to intelligence and reasoning and all the other things that we hold dear about the, about the human brain and the human mind. Christoph Koch wants to come up with a satisfactory scientific theory of consciousness before he dies. Science wants to explain everything. If, if science fails to explain the central fact of my existence, I would say then it's a, it's, it's a failure. In order to gain a better understanding of how parts of the brain work, scientists often look at bits of it that are broken. There is a little part of the brain called the cerebellum, which is at the back of my brain. Uh, if I lose it, I will be unable to, let's say, to dance or be a rock climber and have difficulty moving. My speech becomes slurred, but uh, my consciousness will not be impaired. On the flip side, it seems that some parts of the brain may be essential for consciousness. Identifying these so-called neural correlates of consciousness would help pin down what is happening. What might the NCC, the neural correlate of consciousness, be like? Assuming that it is, that it's an emergent and a neuroscientific process. And let me say straight away that we don't know what it's like. Before his death in 2004, Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, worked with Dr. Koch on something they termed the binding problem. Put simply, the binding problem asks how the brain integrates different bits of information it gets, both sensory and internal, into our conscious experience. In real life, the brain is terribly good and puts everything together, the movement, the shape, and, and the color. The usual way of saying the binding problem is if you have a red square and a green triangle. How is it that, that you don't have, see it as the, get the colors mixed up with the shapes? That's basically the problem. Because our experience of consciousness is derived from the data we get from lots of different systems, the visual and motor being just two, the two men looked at a part of the brain that is connected to all these regions. They were especially interested in the claustrum, a thin sheet of nerve cells that sits at the bottom of the cerebral cortex in each hemisphere of the brain. 
Because testing the claustrum in a live human brain is invasive and risky, no formal experiments have been done. But one happened accidentally last year when a neurologist trying to understand the source of his patient's epilepsy implanted electrodes near her claustra. When he switched the current on, she lost consciousness. As soon as he switched it off, she regained it. No one knows why we have consciousness. It's one of the big mysteries. Why did evolution bother putting consciousness in? How did evolution put consciousness in? Why couldn't we have done everything that we do with a set of objective mechanisms and no first-person subjective experience of the world? Uh, it's one of the biggest questions in philosophy and science. Just as the processes of consciousness remain a mystery, so does its purpose. Is it a high-level summary the brain generates to help us plan for what comes next? A clever way of designing our brains to make us more adept at being social? Neither? Both? One evolutionary explanation for why we have consciousness suggests that an animal capable of modeling the behavior of another can anticipate it to its advantage. The surprising thing is that so few animals actually have this ability. Humans have it. So I have a very good idea of what you're going to do and when you're going to do it and why you're going to do it. And children starting at maybe around three years old get that. Janet Metcalf studies something called the theory of mind. A uh, theory of mind is actually a misnomer. The way we test it is whether a person or an animal can give evidence that they can get into the other person's shoes or the other person's mind and see the world from that person's perspective. Now, the, the test of it is often not just can you see from the viewpoint of the other person, but could you see that someone has a different viewpoint from your own? The theory of mind might provide one way of working out if animals other than humans are conscious. The only species that we're absolutely sure has theory of mind is human. Um, and maybe humans older than roughly three years old. Um, it's very controversial whether any other animals have it. They're arguing about whether chimps have theory of mind or not. Before we can have a theory of mind, we must recognize ourselves. For decades, scientists have used something called the Rouge Test to see whether animals do just that. Human babies do from about 18 months old. Chimpanzees presented with mirrors soon use them to groom themselves, much as we do. Elephants, dolphins, and magpies also can respond to mirrors in ways that suggest self-recognition. Um, the problem with the Rouge Test that the animal researchers um, always raise is that maybe it's just body knowledge, that it's not mind knowledge. So it was interpreted as the animal knowing that they have a mind and theory of mind as we normally think about it is related to another person, not to the self. But presumably you have to know that you have a mind before you project that same capability onto someone else. Identifying the neural correlates of self-recognition in animals would be a hard task. But if we were able to do it, comparative studies would be possible. That would be hugely valuable. Science is edging closer to understanding what parts of the brain might be involved in generating conscious experience. By some estimates, we may not be far away from an empirically sound theory of consciousness and how it evolved. But could a physical theory ever satisfactorily address what it is that people are feeling when they are conscious? David Chalmers calls consciousness the hard problem, a deft description for something that is hard to explain and hard to solve. The methods of science right now are great for explaining objective processes and objective functions. So when it comes even to explaining things like the behavior of an organism, you can tell some story about a bit of the brain a neural process or a computer-like process in the brain that makes us behave a certain way. But the problem of consciousness, what we call the hard problem of consciousness, which is explaining how you get subjective experience from the brain, is not that kind of question. It's not a question about how we behave. It's a question about you know, what it's like, about how it feels from the inside. And it looks like you can explain all those objective mechanisms and objective processes and you still won't have answered the hard problem, which is why is it that all that functioning is accompanied by consciousness? The hard problem divides philosophers and scientists alike. 
Some philosophers argue that consciousness can be explained far more simply. A lot of puzzles, no mysteries. We're going to understand it from the bottom up and from the top down. I have no doubt about that. Daniel Dennett argues that consciousness is nothing more than a cognitive illusion that science will, in due course, explain. Our brains have been designed by evolution and then redesigned by cultural evolution to give us a user-friendly system of things in the world that we deal with. So the user-friendly world that we live in, the manifest image, is a sort of friendly user illusion in the same way that the desktop of your laptop is a user illusion. It simplifies and it distorts in helpful ways for most purposes. If you really want to know what's going on, you have to go backstage. And the same thing is true about the brain and consciousness. Until recently, we didn't have very good tools for doing it. The brain was just off limits, as off limits as distant galaxies. We're now developing the tools for non-invasively studying the brain, and we're now developing the computational ideas and models so that we can understand how a brain can non-miraculously deal with information and refine it and uncover the semantics of the world or outside and inside. So we're now, we now have the toolkit and it's taken this long to develop it. Now we just have to use the tools. Perhaps, but for the time being, the puzzle of consciousness continues to pose more questions than it does answers. Yet another philosopher, Protagoras of Abdera, proclaimed that man is the measure of all things. Until the problem of consciousness is solved, though, that might better be phrased, the measure of all things but himself. <laughs>